now. Okay, great. Then Elaine, you can um, take your share screen off. There you yeah. go. You've All got right. it back. Great. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, welcome to day five and our sure hope you've all been enjoying this as much as I have uh, during this week. And uh, we're going to start, as we always do, with introducing the people we have online today as facilitators, uh, our Peg Stefan and Elaine Bowles-Graham and Kristen Metzger and myself. Uh, our guest speaker today is Travis Rector, and Travis is with us and will sit through patiently as we go through our our morning announcements. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Travis in a few minutes. Um, we had a lot of questions that were filed on our optional form last night. So I'm going to do my best to get through as many as I can. Uh, and if I don't have enough time to keep us on schedule, I'll stop at some point and uh, let Travis uh, have time to do his talk. And we'll try to fit in some more questions at the end of the workshop if we have time. If not, please write to me if there's something you really have to know that we haven't addressed um, in these discussions. So in the beginning, uh, I wanted to make an announcement about protocol for our observatory. Our observatory is Rubin Observatory, and we do not use the acronym VRO. So please, if you can avoid the use of that, we would greatly appreciate it. So if you can't say Rubin Observatory because it takes too long, at least to just say Rubin, and that will be much more preferable to VRO. Um, you are the, uh, you know, you are the participants and you've heard a number of our speakers uh, say that this week, so we're, we're putting a great burden of responsibility on you to correct people as you are in conversation with them. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so I have answers to a few of the questions that were asked of Meg yesterday. I'm still waiting to hear on about four or five of them back. But Rosemary asked, over how many years will it take the projections for the number of small solar system bodies that you'll find? Uh, our survey goes out for 10 years officially. So all those projections that Meg showed, shared with you yesterday are for the first 10 years of our, of our survey. Uh, the, when will scientific observations start? <clears throat> 2023. Uh, but the way this works is we won't have a data release until about a year later. Our first public data release will be six months after observations, but it takes about six months to prepare that data to get it in a release form. So about a year after we start, whenever that is, uh, will be our first public data release. But as I mentioned before, EPO will have access to a little bit of that data ahead of time to use for our investigations. Um, okay, Kenneth, you asked about how is the tremendous amount of data going to get off this remote mountain? So I asked Kristen if she would be kind enough to talk about that a little bit. So Kristen, what I can do is I can uh, bring up uh, the, the infographic uh, and share that. and. We have posted this infographic on the bottom of the first page of the meeting. And there you are. I, so I'm gonna give a very high level answer to that question and um, also let you know that there are um, some resources that you can access to learn a little bit more about it. But basically, you know, Cerro Pachon is a, is a pretty remote location. And um, what the Rubin Construction Project has done is install dedicated fiber optic lines from the um, facility on the summit to the base facility. And so all of that data is going to be coming off the mountain on these dedicated lines. Um, and then once it gets to the base facility, there are a number of partnerships, public and private partnerships that we've made with um, government organizations and private organizations in Chile to get that data as fast as possible um, off of the base site. And then it, it's going to go around the world. It's going to come to the United States. It's going to, we're going to have a data facility in France. Um, there may be other data facilities around the world that we don't really know about yet, 
Um, and so it's going to move. The, the goal is to make sure the data moves very, very quickly and can be at least initially processed very quickly um, because of our alert system. Whenever we detect a change from a previous image, it's going to send out an alert um, within right now we're saying 60 seconds of that happening. So, um, so it needs to move really fast. Fortunately, the Chilean government and community is very astronomy friendly. So it's been um, possible for us to set up those partnerships so that we have the sort of dedicated data lines to move all that data around really quickly. Um, there is, artists, I don't know if you've talked about Margot's video. Um, there's another resource posted on the main page of uh, this meeting and it is, to a YouTube video that was put together very recently by Margo Lopez, who's, um, who works at Slack on our camera. Um, and it, over, it does a great job of kind of giving you an overview of the whole Rubin Observatory system, which is a really complex system. So I'd highly recommend if you have the time to watch that video, um, it'll give you a lot of context for quite a few of the things we've been talking about. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Um, all right, go all right. back over a few more comments. Uh, let's see. Um, we had a question from John. Were you by any chance inspired by the lecture tutorials for introductory astronomy? And that was in reference to the video from yesterday that we looked at from the HR diagram. Why, yes, as a matter of fact, John, we were. Uh, uh, Travis Rector, who is one of our, our guest speaker today, and Ed Prather and I uh, worked together for about a year and a half writing these investigations and all of the support materials um, afterwards I'm still working with Ed on. So for those of you who know Ed, I know a lot of people in college circles know him. He's really an expert on understanding how people learn astronomy and how, how they process it. And so you'll see his stamp very strongly through all of this investigational design. While we're on it, I want to say that Travis was the, the brains behind the investigation you're going to do today. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that late, um, in a moment, but um, this is really his baby. So I'm, I'm really pleased that Travis agreed to, to be our speaker today because I know he had a lot to do with getting this investigation um, in the queue for the ones that we're doing. Okay, another question uh, about the investigation yesterday. The absolute magnitudes look like stellar magnitudes. Is there something else used in the planetary community? Uh, I'll, sh I'll briefly say yes, there is, and we give a long explanation about it in the teacher guide, but it also is called absolute magnitude. But because of course we're looking at asteroids, this is a reflectance magnitude. And so instead of using a capital M for the magnitude, it, uh, that letter is a capital H, which you might've seen in the investigation yesterday. Um, there's another question about the observable universe. It says a source I found cites 48 billion light years. Is it possible to derive this number from the data we see in the investigation? Somebody asked the other day, where did that data come from? And I did find out it came from SDSS, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And so the answer is not now. When we're using this proxy data, we're only getting out to a radius of about 26 billion light years for the universe. So that's why when we did the pretest, I made the correct answer 50 billion for the diameter. Uh, once we have our own data, certainly we'll be able to extend that out quite a bit. Uh, another question about yesterday's investigation. Is there any way for us to have access to the simulations and image stacks that appeared in today's activity? Um, by image stacks, I'm thinking that means histograms, maybe. Um, and so, well, certainly for a while you can play with them. And then if you want to, uh, agree to do user testing, you can use them. But I can't guarantee that they'll be online indefinitely for the next year or so, because as we do with all of our investigations, we're going to de and reconstruct them as we build and improve them based on your many, many suggestions yesterday, which I was 
really thrilled to see how many of you gave a lot of detail. So thank you. Um, okay. Uh, there's a, uh, there's, oh, let's see how much time. I have four more minutes. Okay. I'm going to skip to a couple of the more common ones. Um, international, oh, AU is supposed to be capitalized, not small AU. Well, not really. Um, we actually um, were corrected on this, and uh, the correct abbreviation for AU now, as of 2012, is small a, small u. And that's because the International Astronomical Union, who defines the system of measurements and the SI units that we use, in 2012 issued a proclamation on this, and uh, it's supposed to be little a, little u, just like Hubble's law is now the hubble lemaitre law. And uh, so we're following the convention of the IAU in this regards. And also our planetary scientists who immediately objected to the fact that they saw capital A, capital U in our, in our, our pre-document pre we gave them. Um, okay, it says here, could you please address the OpenStax textbook that is linked in the teacher guides? Uh, yes, I don't know if we'll keep this feature in there, but one of the things we wanted to do was keep the teacher guides relatively brief. Um, I looked online at a lot of teacher guides that are coming out now, and they're on the order of 48 to 62 pages long, which to me is just overwhelming, and I don't know who would really read all of that. Uh, we try to keep them as concise as possible. Once they're on a web page, we'll be able to link off, so they'll be even shorter looking still. But uh, OpenStax uh, is a, a project that uh, has a whole suite of online textbooks that you can use entirely free. And uh, they have a very, very good uh, intro astronomy textbook that's supported with instructor resources and continuously updated. I used it for my high school astronomy class for the last couple years that I taught. I liked it a lot. And I thought for those of you who need just some more background, and maybe you're not really confident or don't know a lot of astronomy, but you find yourself teaching it. Uh, that's a great textbook to go into and just use as a reference or even use it with your classes if you want. It, it can even be downloaded onto a phone. So my students love that because they could do their reading on their phone. And artists, I'm gonna, if I can, I'll pop yeah. in because I've been using OpenStax for quite a while in high school. Um, mm -hmm. The teacher resources are really nice. I've used the astronomy, I've used the physics. Uh, and several others. They also have presentations, so you have PowerPoints to pull from and additional educator resources that are available. So uh, I believe it's, if I remember correctly, it's uh, done by Rice University. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a, I think a funded NSF. It project. is. Yeah. And it, it's really, it's a really nice um, uh, resource to have as a, if you want to have an online textbook, especially to support if you don't have online textbooks for your students right now. It's a great way to give them some support. Um, before I, I want to get one question in here that's in the feed, and it's uh, when the because some people I know have to will be leaving early today. They were just curious as to whether they would be able to access the investigations using the same passwords and logins that uh, they've been using this week. Until when? Uh, I I'm not sure. And like I said earlier this week. For a few weeks, certainly, that meeting page will stay up. But as we, you know, go back into rebuilding everything, I can't guarantee that that meeting page will stay active. So certainly we're going to leave it up for a few weeks. Uh, we would like everyone to have their homework done by Sunday night, the end of the weekend. Um, and I'll speak more about that at the end. Okay. okay. Is that good? I think that would probably an might answer the question temporarily. Thank you. All right, there are a lot more, but it, we're at 11.15 and I'd mm -hmm. like to um, break now and go to Travis. Uh, and I'd like to tell you that uh, I'm really pleased that Travis is with us today. As I said, he and I and Ed Prather have worked very closely in developing these investigations. And, and uh, Travis is co-author of a book called Coloring the Universe, which you see we unashamedly stole that name for this investigation. Um, 
He's a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Alaska Anchorage and uh, knows a ton about creating beautiful astronomical images that also tell a science story. So uh, please ask him questions uh, because he's going to be a great resource for you, especially if you intend to use this investigation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Travis and feel free to share your screen now, Travis. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, going to get my window started here. All right. So thank you for the introduction, Artis. Uh, so as Artis mentioned, I'm a professor at the University of Alaska in Anchorage. But one of the things I also do is make many of the color astronomical images that you see in the news. And just to show you a few of the images I've made that maybe you've seen, uh, there's this one. And then also the, uh, uh, the Eye of God image that came out many years ago. So uh, for many years, I've been uh, making many of the images you see uh, from Kitt Peak, Sarah Tololo, and the Gemini observatories. And so what I want to do with my talk here is, is to first talk about why we make these images, then how we make the images, and then also answer some questions that people commonly have about them. So why do we make these images? Well, the first and most obvious is to help visualize scientific results. If there's a major discovery and we'd like to do a press release about it, we will uh, often create a color composite image to go along with the press release. Uh, another thing that we often do is make images to demonstrate new technology. So for example, this picture right here shows the, uh, one of the adaptive optics systems at Gemini Observatory in operation. And finally, uh, a very small fraction of telescope time is set aside specifically for the purpose of just making pretty pictures, just to make images of beautiful objects in space to share with the public. So how do we make these images? Well, to understand that, it helps to understand a little bit about how our eyes make images and how uh, DSLR cameras work as well. So our eyes have detectors in them called cones, and they come in three flavors, the red, green, and blue. And if you've heard of red, green, and blue, or RGB, uh, that's the way in which we can simulate all the different colors that your eyes can see is by creating different levels of those red, green, and blue. Now our electronic detectors, our CCD cameras, cannot see color intrinsically. They can only produce black and white images. So the way we create a color image is the same way that your eyes do. And that is, is that we look at an object through multiple filters. And so the easiest way to do that is to mimic what the eye does and take pictures of an object through red, green, and blue filters. And then we can combine them together to produce a final color composite image. Now, a big difference between the images that your eyes see and the images that our telescopes see is that we can use many different kinds of filter and, and we can look at very many different kinds of light. So your cone, the cones in your eyes, the S, M, and L cones, the blue, green, and red cones, roughly correspond to blue, green, and red filters. But we have many other kinds of filters that we use in our telescopes. And we can also see other kinds of light. We, in particular, we also use what are called narrowband filters. And these are filters designed to see specific colors of light produced by different types of gases. So maybe you've heard of hydrogen alpha or oxygen three. So we often use these filters as well. So we can also make images using more than just three filters. This is an example of a color two color composite images of the dwarf galaxy NGC 6822. The image on the left shows it as it's seen in three filters and the image on the right is how it appears using eight filters. And in the image on the right, you can see, we can see uh, more vivid detail. We can see the nebular regions in the galaxy better and we can see the colors in the stars better. So what I'd like to do just very quickly is show you how this process works. So I'm gonna show you an example of assembling a color composite image of the spiral galaxy uh, M33. And <clears throat> so this is what the galaxy looks like if we look through a blue filter. And this is what the galaxy looks like through a hydrogen alpha filter. And you can see that the galaxy looks very different. So an important thing that's uh, important to teach to your students is that we use these different filters primarily for scientific purposes. And 
Each filter gives us different pieces of information. So the blue filter shows us where the hot blue stars are in the galaxy. And the hydrogen alpha filter shows us where the warm clouds of hydrogen gas are that these stars are forming in. So how do we create the color image? Well, what we do is we take an image through each filter and then assign a different color to each filter. So for the hydrogen alpha, which is a deep reddish color, we give it a red color. And then we use other filters as well. So this is a image taken through an I-band filter, which is infrared light just beyond what our eyes can see. And in this example, I made it orange. And the reason why I did that is because we're already using red for hydrogen alpha. And a good question to ask is, well, how should we use color when we're looking at kinds of light our eyes can't see? And I'll talk about that in just a minute. Next is the R-band filter, which I have made yellow. And then the V-band, V stands for visible. It's a green filter, which I have made here green. We have uh, the blue filter. And then we also have a U-band filter, which sees light in the ultraviolet, which is again, just above what our eyes can see. So in this example, we take images through six filters. And then we when we combine them all together, this is the final color composite image. So what's really nice about this image is, is that it shows you the rich detail inside the galaxy. It shows you the nebular regions, the dusty clouds, and it also shows the colors of the stars. And in this case, this is simply done just to be a pretty picture, but we can use these different filters to learn about the objects we're studying. So we can use the color filters to measure the temperatures of stars or to determine the composition of asteroids and things like that. If we zoom in in detail, you can see the colors even better. And so one of the things I think is really cool to teach uh, students about is just all the science that comes out of these colors. So rather than having to fly all the way out to these stars and stick a thermometer in them, we can measure their temperature just simply by looking at their colors. Now we do the exact same process when we look at other kinds of light beyond the visible spectrum. So this is an example of doing the process in the infrared. So <clears throat> this is uh, a region of the M17 nebula as seen through infrared light with the Gemini Observatory telescopes. And when we do infrared light or any other wavelength band, we use the same process. That is, we make the lowest energy form of light a red color, the highest energy form of light blue, and, <clears throat> and then the colors in between are intermediate. Now, in this case, we used four bands of infrared light. So we made the lowest energy red, and then green, and then cyan, and then blue. And then the final image that we get combined is this one right here. So while this image is in the infrared and it shows kinds of light that your eyes can't see, it does use the same principles of color. That is, that you would see in the visible. That is, lowest energy is red and the highest energy is blue. Now, when people see these kinds of images, the first question I get 90% of the time is people want to know if this image is real. Of course, we're all familiar with the word Photoshop and how it's become a pejorative for fakery. And so people want to know, are these images they're seeing, are they real? And I love this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon because it actually was written before Photoshop existed. So the questions I most commonly get are, is this what it really looks like? Or are the colors real? Or if I were standing right next to this, is this what it would look like? And in all three cases, what people are wanting to know is, is basically, is the image real? And in particular, is the image real as defined by human vision? And the answer is actually pretty much always no. And I'm going to demonstrate why that is. So this right here is a picture of the Horsehead Nebula that was taken with one of the telescopes on Kitt Peak. And this is a picture as seen by a telescope. Now let's imagine you were to get in a spaceship and fly the thousand or so light years out to the Horsehead Nebula. And then once you got there, you, look out, you looked out one of the portals on your spaceship, what would you see? Well, this is what you would see you wouldn't see any nebulosity at all. So even though you're much closer to it, you still wouldn't be able to see much of anything. So why is that? Well, there's a variety of reasons. One reason is, is that surface brightness is constant. It doesn't matter how far away you are from something. So in other words, if you can't see it while you're here on Earth, you still won't be able to see it even if you get much closer. 
Another thing is that our eyes are famously bad at seeing color and faint light. And in particular, we're really bad at seeing red light, which is why when you go to observatories, you have the red lights around to avoid damaging your dark eye sensitivity. And finally, our eyes can't see all the different kinds of light that are out there. Our eyes can only see a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum called visible light. And my co-author uh, and colleague Kim Arkand has a really great analogy for this. And that is, imagine you have a piano in front of you with 88 keys. And imagine you could only hear one of those keys. Imagine you could only hear middle C. Well, that wouldn't be very exciting at all. And that's kind of how it is with our eyes. There's all these different kinds of light that our eyes can't see, but fortunately we can build telescopes that can see those kinds of light. So when we think about telescopes, it's important to remember that telescopes do several important things. And the three main things that telescopes do, the first and the one that people think about the most is magnify an object, make something that is small appear bigger. And this is what people are usually thinking about. They imagine like a pair of binoculars, how they can make something far away seem close. And it gives you the same sensation if you were right next to that object. Another thing though that telescopes do that people often don't think about is they're designed to collect lots of light and make things that are too faint for our eyes to see bright enough to be detectable. And then finally, to see the kinds of light that our eyes can't see. So the x-rays, the infrared light, and so on. So our eyes are amazing instruments, but they're actually really terrible for astronomy. At their most dilated, they're only about a quarter inch wide at the part that collects light. And for comparison, this is the size of the eight meter mirror in the Gemini Observatory. So what that means is, is that at any given moment, this mirror is collecting about a million times more light than your eye can. And not only that, our telescopes are designed to take long exposures. So we can have the telescope track the night sky and we can collect light for many hours, whereas our eyes are designed to work like a video camera where they're only collecting light for about a 30th of a second before taking the next image. So this allows us to see objects that are billions of times fainter with telescopes. We can see objects that are billion times fainter than what our eyes can see. So just to illustrate this, this is a picture of the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. If we zoom in, the faintest objects in this picture are, I think about 10 billion times fainter than what the human eye can see. So an important way to think about it is, is that telescopes give us superhuman vision. They literally make it possible for us to see things that are invisible to our eyes. So the challenge in making these astronomical images is to translate what the telescope can see into something that your eyes can see. So there's a lot more detail that goes into this. And as our artist mentioned, we did write a book about this called Coloring the Universe. And this book was written by myself and my co-authors, Kim Arkan and Megan Watsky at Chandra X-ray Observatory. And this book is based upon the most commonly asked questions when it comes to astronomical images. So not only the ones that I've talked about as far as are the images real, but a lot of the other steps in there. And I'll mention that uh, this book was written in support, with support from the National Science Foundation to be specifically uh, usable in the classroom. It's not designed to be a textbook, but it is designed to accompany the Coloring the Universe activity that we created uh, that you'll get a chance to do as well. So uh, I hope you'll be uh, interested in picking up a copy. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there. I'm gonna end uh, my share screening and I will be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay. I was going to say right now there's only basic there's uh, one question and that's what software do you use use the use to image and finish pictures? Uh, yeah, so we use several different pieces of software. Uh, the first we use software to process the data and which software we use depends on what kind of data it is. So uh, for processing optical and infrared data, we use a software package uh, called IRAF, which is uh, best described as user hostile. 
And we also use uh, things, we also use Python as well. We're starting to use that more and more. Now, the next step is to convert the data which, uh, into image formats. And for that, we use a piece of software called FITS Liberator. And what it does is it converts the data files, which are in FITS format, into image files, which are TIFF files. And then finally, we use Photoshop to assemble the color composite image. Now, of course, when people hear the word Photoshop, they, they start saying, oh, okay, I know what you're up to. Uh, but all we do with Photoshop is to take the different color images and combine them into, uh, assign colors to each layer and then make the final color composite, just like I showed with M33. And then we also do cosmetic cleanup. We remove artifacts uh, from the images that aren't real. Okay. Next question is, are your color choices you use pretty universally accepted by everyone? So the colors that we use depend on the types of filters and also um, the types of data. So if we, uh, if we have broadband filter images, then we always use what's called a chromatic ordering, which is, a, as I described earlier, the lowest energy light is made red, the highest energy light is made blue, and then we assign colors of the rainbow in between based upon uh, the, the relative energies. If you're using, <coughs> excuse me, if you're using narrowband filters <coughs> or if you're using filters from multiple wavelengths of light, like if you're combining optical with x-ray, then we will do things a little bit differently. And so we don't have a single color scheme that we use for all of our images because each image has different data sets from different types of telescopes. So it's basically impossible to have just one single color scheme. Okay. Um, another question is, what activities do you want high school kids to learn from the most? Which is so the, so the, the Coloring the Universe activity uh, that we have put together is designed not only to show students how color images are made, but also to show this, the kinds of science that can be done. So as I mentioned earlier, we can use color to measure physical properties of objects like the temperatures of stars, or the uh, redshifts of galaxies, or also the compositions of asteroids. So, um, <clears throat> and that's an important point to make, and that is, is that people often think these color images are the science, and these color images are visual representations of the science. But when it comes to doing quantitative measurements, we use the actual data itself, not the color images. Okay, next question. Why the better contrast and detail when you combine eight filters than when you combine three. So how many filters we use depends a lot on the kind of object that we use. And sometimes you can actually do better by having less light. And so that is the purpose of narrowband filters is to block out most of the light except for very specific colors. And so if we're studying a nebula and we wanted to determine the temperature of the nebula, we would use narrowband filters. But in the case of like a galaxy, which has nebulae and stars in it, then we use both narrowband and broadband filters. Uh, do you decide the fraction of each color image for specific effects for the image? Or do you try to stick to the same fixed mixture for one set of filters? So as you'll see in the activity, the colors <coughs> will be balanced differently depending on which filters you have. And when we make our images, we want to use the full spectrum of color because if you have an image that's just monochromatic, if it's essentially all red or all blue, then you're losing a lot of the information that's contained in the data. So in creating these images, we want to help the brain to interpret the image. And if I had more time to talk about it, I would talk about how the brain uses color to understand what it is seeing. And so we use the, the, the hardware inside our brain to help it understand and interpret the images that you're seeing. So for example, uh, we, most people tend to interpret red things as being hot and blue things as being cold. And so we can use that principle to help convey the temperatures of what's being seen. Okay, and then uh, I save this, kind of save this question for the end. Uh, are there ways to translate these color images into something for visually impaired sound or tactile uh, 
impairment or something that we can use utilize? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, Kim Arcand, uh, my collaborator and others have created tactile versions of our images. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we're working on right now is creating versions of our color images for different kinds of color blindness. Okay, uh, are there any other questions? I think the other ones have been answered in the chat line for us. Uh, there was an uh, earlier but, question about is there software available compatible with VR? Uh huh. That was one that I figured I'd let let you field or if I I'm not sure what that means. Virtual reality. Virtual reality. So our our images are are not three dimensional. There are people who have created three dimensional models based upon our images and what they think they might look like three-dimensionally. So I would imagine it's possible to upload one of those into VR, but I don't know how to do that. I've never done it. Okay. One more has popped in. In determining galaxy distances, how much does galaxy color affect the redshift effect? So when it comes to figuring out the redshift of a galaxy, you do need to know the star formation history of it as well. And so that's why we use multiple filters to determine that because you can actually disentangle the star formation history from the, the, the redshift of the galaxy by that method. Another question has come up. How can you access the tactile images you're creating? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so Kim Arcand is the, the person to ask about that and I can, um, if that person who asked the question wants to contact me, I will be happy to uh, help you get in touch with her and she can get those materials to you. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions from the floor? Ah, does your book contain info about the brain processing color or V color? So we do, we do talk about that, yes. We have a chapter devoted to how the brain interprets color to determine things like temperature and depth and motion. So we do talk about that. All right. Any other questions from the floor? Ah, where can, okay. Uh, where can we access the images made for the people who are colorblind? So those images haven't yet been released, uh, but we're hoping to do so within the next year. And there, another question is, could you convert FITS to STL files? Um, I don't know what <laughs> STL files I have to admit, yeah. I'm sorry. Jarvis, you want to pop in, turn on your mic and pop in? I've never heard of that either. Oh, a 3D print file. Could you convert fi uh, FITS to a 3D print file? Um, <clears throat> some, formats, some formats of FITS files might lend themselves to that. <laughs> um, there are types of data sets that are data cubes. And so there is a, there is a third dimension to it. And so in principle, you could do that, but I've never done that. Okay. All right, Jarvis, did you have any other comment or any thoughts? No, uh, I hope no, you enjoy it. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's a comment that um, has turned up when we use the planetarium, because obviously it is fundamentally visual and we occasionally get audiences and you have thrown a curveball when you say, oh, by the way, we've got a blind student. Ah. <laughs> yeah, that's always tough. And uh, there is a comment from Martin that Chandra images uh, have experimented with the SDL files. So uh, sounds like there's some good reef. Ah, how did you get into this, Travis? <laughs> um, <clears throat> how did I get into this? So um, I was a postdoc at Kitt Peak at the time that a new wide field imaging camera was being commissioned. And uh, it was an 8K by 8K array which even by today's standards is pretty impressive. But in 1997, uh, there was nothing else like it. And we wanted to show off the capabilities of the camera. So uh, I had a photography background, so I offered to make some color images to demonstrate uh, the wide field of our new camera. And uh, an important lesson I learned is if you do something once, you, it's a favor. If you do it twice, it's your job. And so uh, I made a few images, people liked them, and they asked me to keep doing it. And uh, I'm joking, of course, because it's something I love to do, uh, but that's how it all got started more than 20 years ago. All right. 
uh, there are no more at this time. So artists, I'm going to hand this back over to you. Yeah, I'd like to thank you again, Travis. Thank you, Travis. Excellent presentation. I know a lot of people are very interested in this and looking forward to it all week. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if you don't get a few more questions coming your way. Well, I'll just say if, if, to all of you participating, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And I'll just mention it's a lot of fun. Students really love it. It's, uh, it has a nice creative element to it that uh, students really enjoy. Uh, Travis, do you have an email or a contact that you want to put into the chat? I will put that or in the chat. Yeah, let me do that now. Thank and you. you can also, um, you know, find the speaker page with Travis's information on it. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you all. Um, I'll be leaving now. Thank you so. for being with us, Travis. Okay, well, you all enjoy the rest of the workshop. Take okay. care. Appreciate Bye, it, everyone. Bye. Bye. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, take a few minutes here and uh, talk to you about what we're going to be doing today in our um, investigation and also something I'd like you to think about as you do that. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, on the meeting page for day five, uh, you'll see underneath resources there's some links for formative assessment and one of the things we're going to be asking you to talk about um, today in your groups if you have time after the investigation is if you do formative assessment how you do it how might you do it for this particular investigation so earlier this week we have given you some examples of summative assessment and today we wanted to talk to you about our plan for formative assessment and get your opinion on it. So there's two documents we're going to ask you to take a look at tonight. One is our general formative assessment document, but I'm going to cut to the chase right now and uh, just show uh, what our coloring the universe formative assessment document looks like at this time. So obviously, you know, our investigations are not completely built out. But what we've done is we've identified what we call checkpoints, places where we think would be a good place to stop the lesson and say, do you really understand what's going on before you go on? And you could do that, of course, through questioning techniques. And there's a lot of different great formative assessment techniques that we share with you on our general page. But what we've done for you as the instructor is just identify places where we think this would be a place you could consider stopping, not that you will, but just as an option for you. And we're imagining that somehow in our investigations when they're done, there will be some little visual cue for you to see on a certain page, oh, this is where I might want to stop the class and have a discussion or ask a few questions. So you see here, uh, we have just identified in the investigation where these checkpoints would be. And then on the right hand side, what students should know. Now, I will tell you that we didn't list everything a student might learn in these investigations, but our philosophy was, what do they have to know to successfully go on to complete the investigation? So maybe there's some other things that they didn't get quite right, but it really won't affect them as they move forward. But these particular things, they will have to know as they go from one section to another. So we have a little document like this, for each one of our investigations. And this, again, will be linked off of the web page and teacher guide once we have one. Um, something else I'd like to talk to you about before we take our break is, uh, as we've done in the last few days, once you come back from break, you're going to be assigned to a breakout room. And you already know kind of what the drill is in terms of introducing yourself and having someone um, choose to share their screen. But I wanted to mention to you today that you have a little bit of a different situation to balance. And so I'd like to explain to you two things you see here on the resources page, the sneak preview and the web app. So when we first started writing these investigations, they were all Google Docs and our first iteration of taking those Google Docs were, was to put them in a document like this. One very long scrolling document 
that has all the widgets embedded in it and <clears throat> works. But obviously, it doesn't look too pretty. And the immediate feedback we got from people is, oh my gosh, my students will faint if they see how long this in. is so much scrolling to do. And so that's when we came up with the idea of paginating all of our documents. And so you can see in the sneak preview link, a format that you're very familiar with. Uh, we had hoped that by today, we would have a completed investigation to show you but we don't have it completed in the new format. So if you want readability, you can move through this format. But when you get to the places where there's a, a tool to use, the tools won't be there. So you need to go back to the old format. You can decide, depending on how linear you operate, if you want to just stick with the old format, go through the whole thing, or if you want to go back and forth between the new format and then when you come to a place where there's no tool, switch back to the old format so you can play with the tool and see how it works. So those are the, the two things I wanted to point out to you today because it's a little different than what we've done before. <coughs> so again, under resources, it's called the web app. And that's what you've been clicking on all week. And then sneak preview is our new design that's not quite all there yet. Does anybody have any questions about that? Is that understandable? Okay. All right. Um, so seems like everyone's okay with that. Uh, so let's take a five minute break. We're gonna come back and uh, let's try to be back by 52 and we will put you in breakout rooms then. Thank you.